Hi everyone and welcome to Lurking for Legends, a live video cast where we do live reads with amazingly talented authors of all genres, which is actually going to be Richard tonight. Um, I'm Christy Stratus, historical suspense and historical fantasy author, and my awesome co-hosts are epic fantasy author Richard H. Stevens, who will be reading tonight, and science fiction author David M. Kelly. Lurking for Legends is an interactive broadcast, and we encourage viewers to comment and ask us any questions you may have. So we actually did have a guest lined up for tonight, but we needed to reschedule him. So it's just going to be the three of us, and we are going to do a live read. But first, we're going to just update you all on um, what's going on in our author worlds and what's coming up for us. We're in like the last quarter of the year or so. So um, so actually, why don't we start with uh, Dave, if you don't mind? You just had an event and like what's what's going on with you and what's up for the rest of the year? Okay. Um, yeah, I just uh, was at uh, the... Uh, the uh, well, book Eat festival meals. in in Eden Mills. And uh, it's a very good event. Lots of people go there. Um, very popular with readers and authors of all kinds. Um, it was a very nice event, very nice day, very busy. Um, so that was uh, very good. Um, other than that, uh, well, I am continuing to work on the second um, Hyperia Jones novel. Um, Things have got very strange in Hyperia's <laughs> world. <laughs> Good. <laughs> oh, it be. Which is kind of par for the course, really. Um, and I am uh, around about two thirds of the way through editing my Joe Ballon prequel novella. Very cool. uh, so hopefully that will be coming out in maybe a month or so. That's going to be released. Um, free through my website as uh, a series of episodes for anybody to read. And also I'll be making it free to subscribers of my newsletter nice. as an ebook. Cool. That's a, that's a, something to really look forward to. Yeah. It's, it's, I think it's, it's quite fun. There's a, a, a lot of Balanesque um, cynical humor in there and mm -hmm quite a few dead bodies so yeah <laughs> always positive <laughs> oh there's margaret found you guys every time i panic always. yeah it goes to my page i do i share it onto there i'm just sharing it now actually <laughs> <laughs> yeah unfortunately uh the streamer charges us we do it on all of our account so we scaled back to my account and which isn't maybe the best idea but uh, i'm not sure what else to do so we do share it on our channels after the fact but you can't participate live so and yeah. of course you have to go through my facebook account and i probably don't get the same reach as christy would so i don't know about that i share <laughs> it while it's live anyway so <laughs> i can tell you i don't get much reach I, I usually share th this, and I have to confess that uh, this week I completely forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I share it to a place called the Book Lounge, and I, I don't know whether we get any generic followers there. Again, the problem with uh, doing the Facebook Lives is they basically have to be part of your page, I would think, or part of my page, I mean, mm -hmm. to, to actually view it. I'm not yeah. sure what happens when they click interested or going, whether it just takes them there without them having to like my page. If that's the case, then that's great. If they have to like my page, I might deter them. So but I'm not sure how that Yeah, works. I don't know. If you say that you're interested in an event, I think it's supposed to tell you no matter what. But well, that would be nice, yeah. <laughs> that, would, that way it wouldn't weed out the so, people yeah. that get hooked up, yeah. So i just going to chime in, Christy, before you, uh, just yeah. because uh, I happen to see uh, the amazing science fiction author, David M. Kelly, at my event on Saturday. <laughs> we had a guest that appearance from a science fiction author. We were at uh, the Fergus Steampunk Festival, the first one to be held mm. in Fergus. It was the first annual, and it was a good event for me. Uh, and all of a sudden, Dave and his lovely wife showed up and because uh, they were down so they could do the Eden Mills Writers Festival the next day, so they popped in to see us. And I got, actually, I have it right here. I got my very own signed copy. I haven't shared it on my social nice. media. I'll be doing that this week. But uh, I can never say the name. Quaglas and Storm. Is that right? <laughs> <What? laughs> Quellension. Like my tongue. You just, you just broke it. 
<laughs> broke my tongue. Uh, it's not that difficult. Come on. Kalangshin. <laughs> Kalangshin. <laughs> I'm glad I don't have to say that. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I've got, I'm the proud owner of the book. So uh, thanks, Dave, for dropping that off. And, uh, and the lovely treats you gave us. Uh, we, CJ really enjoyed them. I had one, but I'm not into fancy chocolates. Uh, Christy would have liked them. They brought mm. us this really fancy box of chocolates, and they were different colors. <laughs> of things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I noticed yeah. they didn't last very long, according to the no, they were purse. <laughs> as soon as you guys turned your back and left us, they were gone. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I got to eat one, and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that, that that's what's new with me uh, as far as uh, my writing goes. Uh, it, not a lot's been going on in this book. I keep telling people it's going to be out at the end of the year, and I hope it is. But uh, I've had a bunch of setbacks uh, over the summer, so uh, hopefully uh, we can get it back on track uh, as uh, the fall hits. Well, you, you didn't uh, specify the year, so I mean, no, <laughs> not, not, actually, I, I said the end of this year when I speak to most people. Ah. so I've actually had people last week. Two or three people saying, you know, when's the book out? When's the book out? Now? I wanted to have it out for this weekend because uh, this weekend I'm going to be at the Waterloo Medieval. It's called the Royal Fair. Waterloo Royal Fair mm -hmm. is a medieval festival in Waterloo, Ontario. So if anyone is in Ontario or even the northern states along the border, you want to come up to an awesome medieval festival, come on up and see us. Uh, we're a couple hours from the U.S. border and uh, have a lot of fun. So we'll be sending up there. I always... Uh, post on my social media that the dragons are preparing to fly to such and such a place and we keep them well fed so they don't snack on the children and people's pets. So uh, <laughs> we should have a lot of fun and I, I really enjoy this. Uh, it's one of my biggest events because it's my genre and that's that's a really cool mm -hmm. thing about uh, when you're selling books, if you can find an event that is your genre, you can do pretty well. So mm -hmm. that's what's new with me. How about you, Christy? Um, well, it's all to do with uh, prohibitive magic, which is on Kindle Vella and Patreon. So yeah, that is a good problem to have, isn't it, Margaret? <laughs> Richard, you're lucky. That's great. <laughs> They're waiting. <laughs> They're waiting for your book. So um, yeah, to do with uh, prohibitive magic publishing on Kindle Vella in episodes and on Patreon. So episode 15 is what I'm writing now. I believe episode 11 is what just published uh, most recently. So. Um, it's been going well. It's been going smoothly. I'm really enjoying writing it. I had said that book one, uh, which is going to be renamed, the series is going to be named Grimoire, Society of Dark Acts, and the first book is going to be renamed um, Grimoire Magic. So it'll be Grimoire Magic, Corrupted Magic, Prohibited Magic, and we'll keep going along those lines. And then, um, yeah, I had said something about hoping to publish the first book and maybe have the second one up for pre-order this year. I don't really know where this year went, honestly. I have no <laughs> idea. It's September already. I had been very um, gung-ho on making a lot of the changes I wanted to make before I put it in paperback and ebook. Um, but then I had a lot of busyness happen with my editing business. So um, I didn't have as much time to put into the first book as I wanted to. So it may have to be next year. Sorry. Um, it just it just goes that way. Margaret says, do you have to go through a whole new set of ISBNs for new titles like that? Um, <clears throat> so for, for Kindle Vela, um, I guess if it it does, it has an AISN. Um, so I will have to buy ISBNs when I publish paperback. Um, and the ebook will have Amazon. I can, you know, buy for that for other platforms as well. So it only has an AI, AI SN. <laughs> so I will have to buy the ISBNs. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm aiming for next year now, you know, and I'm kind of like half beating myself up over not getting it out at the end of this year. But what can you do when things get busy and you just don't have the time? I don't want to release it like too early or something and not be able to put the effort in. So I've, I had like a change list of all the things I want to change on book one, and I've done a lot of it. So I'm, I am, you know, I've got a lot of it done and I'm still working on the rest of it. You know what my hardest part of <laughs> what the hardest thing to remember in this series is people wearing hats. I can't get it into my head I just can't. <laughs> and it's terrible. Margaret says, what can you do when people want to pay you for edits? Also a good problem. Yes, Margaret, you're absolutely right. I'm not like, that's why I say I'm half beating myself up because it's just frustrating to not get it out when I said I would. But at the same mm -hmm. time, what are you going to do? You know, it's all for positive reasons. I can't be that upset. So <laughs> thanks, Margaret. Yeah, that's true. So that's what's going on with me. Um, I'm betting that Prohibited Magic will finish up publishing 
Oh God, no, I didn't count the weeks. I can't say next year. I have no idea when it's gonna finish. <laughs> we're in episode 15. It's about, it's over 30,000 words. I still feel like we're sort of just getting going. So it's probably gonna be mm -hmm. another nice sized one, which it's is exciting. Coming epic, I told you. Yeah, very exciting. I never thought it would happen, but here we are. So you brought up ISBN, so I was curious. I'm always jealous actually of uh, US authors because when I send my books to, well, anyone, uh, our postal service is awful. They don't support their their artists. Whereas the U.S., mm -hmm. you have a media rate, and it costs what about three to five dollars to send a book. Yeah, but so uh, the one thing that they do support us is with ISBNs. I can uh, use a billion ISBNs, and it doesn't cost me a nickel. So, what? Mm -hmm. I'm just curious. What does an ISBN cost a U.S. author? I know you can buy them in bundles, which must make them cheaper. But uh, if I was to buy an ISBN for one book, what would that cost me? It's a good question. Um, I haven't bought one. I this is, I haven't even bought one since um, like 2017. I did buy a bundle of them, okay. but I can't remember how much they cost you. You know, a lot of people buy from Bowker. So right. if you're ever interested in finding out, you, you know, you can look there and see what they charge. Other people recommend other places, but it's the most popular. Yeah. B-A-O-W, oh, B-O-W-K-E-R, right, Bowker? That's it. Yeah, yeah. And if, you know, if you're going to be publishing a lot, you, like you said, you buy in a bundle and it's a little cheaper. <laughs> I think they're about twenty or thirty dollars, aren't they? They're they're pretty expensive. They're pretty right? expensive. Yeah, well, I, I can't uh, remember. Just to clarify, Margaret, I am not jealous of uh, the Americans the ISBNs. I am saying that's the one thing that's good about the Canadians is uh, they support us for the ISBNs. But uh, but you know, oh uh, with God. regard to mailing books, uh, it cost um, me twenty dollars to mail a twenty dollar book. Oh, that is yeah, yeah. yeah, and if I want to mail it to the states, it's even more. So I always uh, encourage people to buy if they're going to buy a book from me through the mail to at least buy a trilogy because it's the first book that the most cost goes on to, and then mm -hmm. there's you know maybe a couple more dollars and I get two more books in there. But uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, Margaret, wow. Margaret, Margaret says one hundred and twenty-five dollars for wow. one. That's right. Holy yeah, for holy. one. And wow. then if you buy 10 of them through Bowker, I just found it. Thanks, Margaret. That was great. Um, 10 through Bowker is $2.95, so it's like discounted, but it's expensive. Like That is expensive. That's crazy. Wow. Not surprised if it jumps again wow. soon. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised either. It's So if you're going to get, so if I release a book in the US, mm -hmm. I, I don't need one for an ebook, obviously, because it's ASIN, but uh, if I'm releasing a hardcover, and I'm releasing a paperback, that's going to cost me $250? Mm. I believe so, yeah. Wow. I believe so. Maybe I so, just, I'll stop, I'll stop whining about our media rate until I start selling enough. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's, yeah. it's Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. yeah, it is crazy. Very when highly commercial. New series, I go right into my ISPNs and I will just start picking, I'll do ebook, paperback, hardcover, audible. Like audiobook, I'll go bang bang. Mm -hmm. I'll do all four for the whole series, yeah. so they're all mm -hmm. sitting there. And then it says pending, like the date of release is just a pending. And then when it's ready, I just flip over the date to today's date if I release it today. So, yeah, wow. Yeah, it's I mean, a whole the, thing. The, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Chrissy. Sorry. No, I was just gonna say it's. I seem to remember. Sorry if I'm wrong on this, but I seem to remember that you have to get it like all your information right the first time too. Um, otherwise, like it's tough to change it, or you have to get a new one or something. It's crazy. I don't know. What were you going to say, Dave? No, I was just going to, going back to Rich's point on the uh, on the cost of postage here. Um, um, one of my readers who lives fairly close to Richard, um, he wanted a copy of my latest book, and uh, I previously mailed them down to him. But it almost doubles the cost of the book, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, to send it. And he's still in the same, like, province. You know, he's only... Yeah, four hours away, kind of thing, and it's like it's it's like the book's kind of like twenty dollars, and the postage is twenty dollars. So this time, I actually uh, I I gave the the copy to Richard to pass on to him, sort of thing. Um, yeah, and I'm only charging so, you fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it is. It's, it's like postal rates in, in Canada are just really they're crazy. hideous, absolutely. Yeah. It's through the roof. I mean, to send up to you, it's expensive. It can be, I think the last time I sent it was like $22, but to send in the U.S., even the farthest location, I think it was like, I don't know, $5, $6 mm -hmm. was in it with a heavier book, you know? Yeah. But a lot of times for, for my types of books, it's more like 350 or something, so. 
Um, you know, they're, they're slimmer, the, not the epic ones, <laughs> the, uh, yeah. the historical suspense. Well, once I become famous, then I guess I can complain about our media rate. So you, you probably pay more in ISBNs than I do in post it. So I don't, <laughs> I don't mail a lot of books, but so Anita, I, I posted this thing that Anita posted it, uh, that Anita suggested here, but I'm thinking that if the USBs are supplied by Amazon, then Amazon owns that ISBN, so you can't use it anywhere else. Yeah, you can use the AISN only on Amazon, and then you buy the ISBN so that you can publish the paperback anywhere. Right. For example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that some people will buy their ISBNs through different uh, book publishing companies, or, and they can only have, publish that book with that company. Yeah. But is that not correct? Like, I, we don't have that problem because we just get our own off uh, the Canada.ca website and we're golden. But uh, with you guys, if you were to get one from, let's say, Ingram Spark and they provided you the ISBN, you're, that book is exclusive to the ISBN, at least that edition. Is that not right? If you wanted to go somewhere else, you'd have to, like, if you want to publish again on Amazon, you'd have to use an, a different ISBN. Um, I'm not sure about that uh, because Ingram Spark, I believe, goes to Amazon, so I'm not well, sure. I'm just, well, I'm but not splitting hairs, but if they were totally two different companies, it might I, be. Can, I can use one ISBN for one paperback and they can publish it anywhere. Yeah, yeah. It, no, it might be. Yeah. I'm, this I'm not like a super expert on. <laughs> I just, but I, I only bought one ISBN for the paperback last time and could sell it anywhere, but you know, I'm not, I didn't go through a company like that. I went through just Bowker and Hmm. I didn't yeah. publish during Grim Spark. Okay, I yeah, think it does change things. Yeah. Yeah, it requires you to su supply your own. Yeah. So I see. Okay, so they, then it's not an issue then. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So anyway, before we get to my library, uh, we were supposed to have Russell Trimble on here and uh, he couldn't make it. Uh, I just want to give a shout out to Russell. Uh, he uh, he's not feeling well. He's going through a series of migraines and stuff. He's got some health issues. And uh, but uh, if anyone was here last last month. Russell's the guy that got me, gave me the confidence to actually come online and actually speak to anyone because I am not, I'm a wallflower. When we do go to parties, I'm the guy in the corner that doesn't say anything to anyone. I don't enjoy being in a social uh, uh, limelight. Uh, I, I do okay at book events, but it took me a bit to get used to that. Uh, Dave helped uh, me through that. I, I remember doing the first uh, event up at the Graphicon with Dave and I got to watch Dave in action and I just had two little novellas there and I remember just sitting there kind of twiddling my thumbs and looking over at them and watching them sign books. And I'm just, I hope someone buys one of my books. And I'm, someone came up to me, uh, I said, so what's your book about? And I just looked at him like he was an alien and I just handed my book and said, I didn't know what to do. You know, I, I've gotten a lot better at that because I've done so many book events, but uh, uh, if it wasn't for Russell, I would never be doing this. He used to do live reads. He still does. And I feel like I'm going to do that too. And that's how I met Christy as well. So uh, without Russell, I wouldn't have met Christy, and uh, that's what how we got involved in doing this Lurking for Legends. We're into almost our third year now, so that's uh, that's amazing. We're two and two and some years. I guess we're almost complete three years. So wow, yeah. He was supposed to be a guest. He's not here today. So uh, at some point, where you're just gonna have to sit through uh, my reading. And we're at all, some point, <laughs> we're all looking forward to David's costume. But uh, before we get on to that, I just want to go ask you guys. Uh, what's your plan? So Christy, what's your plan with uh, your writing now? Uh, I know you're an editor and all that, but on the writing side, what is your plan with your series? And uh, what have you got coming up next? Do you have some kind of timeline with what you want to do? I'm just interested in how you vision the future of your Dark Grimoire series and anything else that's coming down the pipe. Yeah, um, that's a great question because it's very much by the seat of my pants because I'm a pantser. And so I never really know how many books there will be. So this is, um, you know, I have three books now. I'm working on the third one part of the way through it. Like I said, over 30,000 words. So I have a feeling it's going to be another big one. And then um, I know there will be a fourth book for sure. Um, I kind of envision it as five, but I can't say definitely until I've written it. I'm kind of seeing the benefit of, you know, what people say when they say, um, write a whole series before you publish it. Uh, I'm sort of seeing the benefit of not having put it in paperback yet, because in this third book, um, actually we had voting for the um, the Ruin Rats leader's name um, in my Facebook group, which was uh, Christy, which is Christy Stratus's Victorian Darklings. And we vote on a lot of stuff there if you want to join it. Rhino Dave um, didn't make it. 
<laughs> Chaos Rhino was in the running. That's it, Chaos Rhino. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the, the name that won was Benjamin Botswick. And it was really funny because once that name was picked, people... <laughs> We always love him. He's not class. very happy. He's the leader of your group. Yeah. Who else looks like a leader? He says. <laughs> that, that looks like a leader of a notorious Victorian group. Yeah. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. So um, once the name was chosen by everyone, <laughs> um, it really came to me like uh, what his what his whole goal was. And now I need to go back into books one and two and plant seeds and stuff. So I'm kind of glad that I had to wait in a way. Um, so I foresee, I think it's been about a book a year, I want to say, because it's been, I had my two year Velaversary <laughs> this year, and I'm already on the third book. So it's like, I don't know, a book, a book and a half, something like that a year, and I'm just going to keep going that way until... That's still a good progress. I think mm -hmm. so. I mean, for me, mm -hmm. it takes me a while, a lot of times to write the book and then edit it and then get all the stuff together with the cover and all that. So... Um, for me, that's really, really good. It's keeping me on progress, on um, on point there. So however long that takes, maybe a couple of years from now, it will be done completely, you know, the series, maybe a little bit less than that. We'll have to see. But um, after that, what I really would like to do is, um, and I keep thinking about it, is I've always promised the third book in the Dark Victoriana collection, and it has never happened because the main character will cooperate with me. And it's really nothing more than that. I wrote a ton of that book. Um, well, a good amount of that book and um, had to delete most of it because it just, it's not working, you know, and the guy mm -hmm. isn't who he's supposed to be. So I'm trying a couple different ways that he's kind of, his personality. Um, it's a, it's a character is Timothy from book two. Um, for those of you who have read it, uh, Brotherhood of Secrets. And the problem is that he starts out as a young teenager. And in the second book, we skip ahead 10 years. And so I seem to be having trouble for some reason, um, really grasping his character 10 years later. And everything I write seems to be wrong. So um, I'm trying out a completely different thing now. And we'll see how that works. But that's kind of my, I guess you could say that's about maybe like a three year plan at the moment, something like that. So it's kind of where I'm headed. And like I said, I want to publish the paperbacks and the eBooks and maybe even hardcover for this historical fantasy. It means a lot to me. So it's coming. I, I find it interesting when you say you're posting a book or a book and a half a year. And, you know, as any authors, we think, oh, it's, I'd like to write more. And you see all these uh, different people who are just pumping books out. I don't know how they do it, but uh, we're not going to get into that. Uh, and, uh, but I, I remember, uh, when I used to, when I was younger, before I even published books, I remember you know, we didn't have the internet and all that. And I was waiting for Robert Jordan to come up with his next book. Mm -hmm. So you read The Wheel of Time, you read the, and then you wait for The Great Hunt. And you know, two or three years later, The Great Hunt comes out. Yeah. And then you wait two or three more years, and then the next book comes out. And I, I know there's things that they have to do in the traditional publishing world where, you know, they don't just write the book, edit, and, you know, throw it on the bookshelf, where uh, as indie authors, we can do that. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes the some of the editing gets uh, put aside, which is unfortunate. But mm -hmm. even if we do it properly, we can do it a lot faster. And people say, well, you publish a lot of books. And I said, well, you know, I don't have to do the things that the traditional publish, you know, going through the traditional publishing route. Or I got to wait for this. I got to wait for that. You know, if if yeah. Del Rey came to me and said, here's $500,000 to do it, uh, you know, by all means, it'll take me. <laughs> yeah. If I'm okay with that. But that's not a reality. So the nice thing about being in the authors, you can put them out fairly quickly. That's absolutely true. Yeah, it's a benefit for sure. I just want to that's put a couple one, of things That's out. one of the reasons um, I saw somewhere, that was one of the reasons why uh, Stephen King were under pseudonyms because his publisher wouldn't publish more than one book of his per year. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Wow, I didn't. I don't think I knew that, no. That's interesting. Yeah, that was, so that was the marketing weird. and uh, taking advantage of the, uh, yeah. I guess, yeah. We don't have to worry about it because we don't sell that many books. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so I just want to put a couple things here before it gets lost. Uh, Margaret was saying, uh, if you have a paperback in Amazon, you can enjoy SBS from Docker. You can listen to paperback in Amazon. I ASPN, but... So this is just for any authors uh, that are wondering about that question. It's better now just fill through Ingram and miss out on and likes in her opinion. And then she goes on to say that, uh, oh, she's asking you, have, you, have you found any success with with a frustrating book character by going on a writing retreat? <laughs> and it sounds like she might be going on a writing retreat because she's <laughs> hoping you're going to give her the answer she wants to hear. 
I've never been on a writing retreat, so I could not tell you, unfortunately. I've thought about it. Yeah, I've thought about it. I just never I think it'd be really yet. cool. I'm just too cheap to pay the price that they want for these things. <laughs> yeah, I think I would be distracted, honestly, because I, I'd be like, I'm on vacation. I'm in a new place. I want to look all around and do things, you know. But I'm just doing just cannonballs in a hot tub when they're trying to concentrate. Yeah, it wouldn't be good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I've heard that, you know, for some people getting away like that, Margaret, um, really breaks uh, whatever stagnation you might have wherever you're writing normally. And um, it can, it definitely works for some people. Um, for me, like this is the toughest block type of thing, which I don't really believe in writer's block. It just means that I'm not hitting it right. Something is off, yeah. you know, something is mm -hmm. off in it. Um, but this is the toughest one I've ever had. Usually if I just kind of decide I'm just gonna write whatever and I start typing garbage, you know? This is um, though, right? It will, it will flow. It will start coming to me and it will work. But it's uh, it's something about this gap that's um that's doing it's, it it's also book three right it's book three yeah yeah, yeah. I, I i find that's a book three syndrome oh do you do you oh i feel better <laughs> yeah no absolutely because you, you just it's you've done so much with those characters and they've evolved so much like when you write a new character there's so much to write about because there's so much to discover with that new character especially as a pantser you have no yeah. idea what that character is about you don't know his mannerisms and you discover all those things as you're writing that first book and it's almost like uh, going out on a first date and, you know, you're, you're, the dating mm -hmm. process where you're finding out about uh, your new partner and it's so exciting. And after book one and book two, you, you know, all of a sudden you start getting old stale. And the, by the time you hit book three, I, it almost seems like those that muse isn't there anymore. Now you're just trying to get the story done. Mm -hmm. I find it's, I find it can be a slog getting through that third book for sure. Uh, that's a relief, actually. I have to I've say. never been, I've never been on a writing retreat. I actually find that, uh, the best way, if I'm struggling with a book, uh, like with writing a story, Marley, I, I actually find that uh, the most effective thing I can do is start writing another one. And then I realize what the hell was wrong with the one I was on. Mm. Yeah. 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 Maybe, I, maybe I just need to step away and uh, see, I'm just, I'm, I'm a sucker that I need to finish it. Like I, I'm not going to George R. Martin and I'm going to finish it. I'm yeah, yeah. Try to get to the end of it before I start the next one. I've got 20 books in my head that I want to fill the gaps in my uh, timeline, but I won't jump into those until I'm finished with it. And maybe I should just maybe do a chapter or two on a new story just to freshen up my mind for the old story. It's not a bad idea. Can I yeah, it's like it, your brain kind of like switches away and, and your subconscious mm. starts working in the background and, mm. and processing things. And... Uh, it's like I find that actually is is really good for get me. I was struggling a little bit with um, with the second book uh, for of Hyperia for a little while, and uh, so I started working on another project that I've got planned for after that. And uh, as soon as I started working on that, it's like a few days later, it's like that's what I need to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> on Hyperia. <laughs> like, well, speaking of which, Dave. Uh, so let's get into you then. Uh, what what's new and what's coming up with, with like you? Like, what are your plans going forward? You're working on a second Hyperia. Now we got uh, this title here. Then now that this one's done, that uh, mm -hmm. so where's this one going? I know you have a Joe Balance sequel coming. Yeah, I got the uh, well prequel off, actually, Balance, but, but, but yeah, um, yeah um, I've got that one uh, coming out fairly soon. Uh, and just finishing off the editing on that. Um, after that, um, I've got another series planned, which will be in the same universe as uh, the Joe Ballon books and the Logan Two Feathers books, but it's kind of like further into the future. Um, mm -hmm. And uh... sorry, I'm just reading. Oh, sorry, Dave. I don't, I don't mean to start off. I'm just trying to. It's all right. No, no. I was just reading Anita's post there about poisoning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're gonna, I'll phone the police uh, on the side here. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, it's in the same kind of universe. Uh, that universe is a one that I've got planned for kind of like extended storytelling. Um, and so the next series I've got uh, planned to release, which hopefully I'll have the first book of that out next year, um, is going to be set about 150, 170 years ahead of the Joe Ballon stories 
and this is when kind of like um humans have kind of like gone out and populated the universe much wider than earth itself uh but i've still got the political factions and the hostility between them so you've got like the earth kind of alliance and then you've got like the uh, what i call the corporates which are kind of like these business run worlds um and so that as i i'm uh, i'm planning to start work on that well I've, I've started some work on that um and uh i kind of know where i'm going and where i'm starting and not much else <laughs> Yes, that's the way I work. <laughs> you know, um, but, but that's, I think that's, it's going to be good. It's going to be, um, it's going to have a little bit more of a military edge to it. Um, so uh, that's going to be a slightly different uh, take for me. Uh, but it'll still have the same kind of classic sort of David M. Kelly sort of like snark. <laughs> and uh, and so on you know um and lots of action um i've got the actual galaxy planned out sort of thing in my 3d uh star mapping software and uh it's it's quite interesting because like the actual i'm not going to go into too much detail but uh, the actual kind of uh story world is going to be set in what is called the Balan verse, oh. which um, basically is um... <laughs> <laughs> which is basically a, a volume of space centered around Earth, uh, fifty light years in radius, and basically because of Mister Balan, um, humans are confined to that 50 light year sphere and uh, so they only have the uh, resources that are kind of like within that sphere uh, which they're not too happy about because there's not that many habitable planets although there are plenty of non-habitable planets but uh, yeah so uh, it's going to be uh, an interesting uh, an interesting setting i think cool nice that's great just before we get going, uh, we should, I think we should jump into our library in a minute. So, Dave, if you mm -hmm. want to take your moment now okay. to get yourself ready, I'll get uh, right. on a little bit about uh, what's going on with me, and then uh, we'll set her up. So you go ahead and get yourself ready if you want. And you, in case you need to. Oh, yeah. he's gone. I knew he going to do that. He's <laughs> going to go off screen. At least he knew what I did and stick a sticky there and lose it. But uh, <laughs> so risk. the Soul Forge universe. Uh, it was only supposed to three books, and then when the dragon came in at the end of book three, it opened up my whole universe for me. I went back in time 500 years, and I mentioned that an elf queen who was 700 years old at the time in that series, so I've gone back in time 700 years from there. I keep going backwards, and there's great big gaps now, As and with any kind of fantasy, you get so much lore in your head. So every time I write a fantasy book, I generally have two more in my head by the time I'm done. So that's... Yeah, it's going to take a while to finish this. Hopefully, uh, I live longer than my father did, so I have a chance ah. to get it done. But uh, yeah, but uh, so the nice thing about mine is is done. I've, I've, the last trilogy is the first one I wrote. So if anyone ever jumps into the Soul Forge universe, the last book is already written. They just have to read up through it. But what I want to do is chronologically go forward from book one to the end now. And uh, so once I finish this series, I'm supposed to research trip to the British Isles. It didn't happen because of COVID. I think I'm just going to jump into it without doing it. I've done a lot of research uh, on the side. I'd, uh, I'd love to go to British Isles, but I don't think that's a reality for me right now. So I'm going to start book one in the Soul Forge universe, and it's going to take place on Earth. So hopefully that will be uh, coming out next year, and it'll be a shorter book than what I've been writing lately. So hopefully I'll be able to get that one and one more written next year. And uh, so anyone uh, jumping into Soul Forge universe from that point on will hopefully be able to read forward with me. Instead of jump, I've taken my readers forward and backwards and in between. And uh, yeah. it's sometimes at book events, I confuse the heck out of them when they say, well, what's the right first? What's the chronological order? Blah, blah, blah. And, but so anyway, that's what's new with me. Uh, and When Legends Rise, which is book four in the High Cliff Guardian series, is one I'm writing now, the ones that people keep asking about. My plan is to have it out at the end of this year. 
realistically, it's probably going to be January uh, at the earliest. Uh, but I'm not in a rush because all my book events will be done by Christmas time, and I don't start a new book event probably till April or May. So I, I know I have a few readers that want it before then, but uh, I'm not going to rush it. Uh, so hopefully it'll be out uh, around January. I've had uh, a couple things come up, and uh, I won't get into it. But uh, yeah, it's, it's been a tough summer. But uh, yeah, so hopefully we'll get back on track now and uh, we'll go forward from this point. And I just want to say a couple more things from Margaret here. Mom's finished. I haven't read that one, but I've heard from like everyone that it's really good. I should really read it. Oh, look who's here. Now I'm not sure if he wants me to bring him in or not. I'm going to unmute him and just ask him. No? Okay, he's putting thumbs up. All right, here we go. <laughs> Holy. All right. This, You're muted, you Dave. You can't yourself. I don't, see, I don't know if you can even see her. That is outstanding. There you are. That's awesome. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Can you actually see your screen? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what you're going to be doing around Christmas time? You're going to be putting a red yeah, suit on oh and uh, sitting in the mall. Mm. Or are you yeah, going to be that. More like bad Santa, I think. At I, I could do the extra cash. <laughs> now, Christy, you and Dave just keep talking for a minute. I'm just going to put my little thing on. It's not going to be uh, that elaborate, but uh, I'll be back in just one <laughs> second. Dave, I love your hair. Who does your hair? I need this. Bingo. What did you say? Bingo. Bingo does your hair. <laughs> yeah, it, I actually made all of this from his coat. It was like he's molting. And uh, so, uh, yeah. Oh, Stitching sorry. Sorry, Bingo. I didn't mean to call you. <laughs> oh. Now he's all he excited. Heard me, he heard me say his name, so he, uh, he came. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is really fantastic. Is that... <laughs> Excuse me. Is that paper that you have under there, or what is no, that? It's, it's it's um it's hair. It is it is hair. Yeah. Well. It's oh. Plastic. Okay. Plastic, huh? Plastic. Okay. I gotcha. <laughs> that looks really good. <laughs> you look like you need a staff. Yeah. Actually, I, I should have a staff, and I forgot to get one. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's fantastic. Can't really beat that. <laughs> Although Chaos Round though is a close second. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Oh. The boss is back. <laughs> Everyone has beards. I'm almost jealous. <laughs> okay, Chrissy, let's see your beard. I need to get a beard. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so watch out. Okay. So we are going to be reading today an excerpt from Wizard of the North. And this is the, the second book of my series, my original series. And uh, this is the book that I had no idea where it was going. In 1982, when I thought of Soul Forge, I knew it was going to be three books. And I knew the beginning and I knew the ending. Battle of the Beards, yes. Battle of the Beards. I did not know where book two was going. And I, it was originally going to be called The 13 Eyes of uh, Helleden. And oh. but I didn't I didn't know how to fill it. And uh, when I sent the artwork or the ideas for the artwork to my cover, put it in his hand. And he was never supposed to have a staff in his hand. He was never supposed to be a wizard. And I said, Marco, what are you doing? There's no staff in his hand. He said, I thought he was a wizard because I described him just like Dave looks. Dave looks like Alina. And uh, okay. I thought about it for a couple of days. And all of a sudden I said, Marco, that's brilliant. Leave it in there because that idea filled in book two. And my wow. whole thing took off. And because of that, the Soul Forge universe was born. And I, we've gone back in time. And I, I tr truly believe that these 20 to 30 books all came because of that artist's mistake in book one. And so That's it's amazing. really, really neat how things happen. But uh, So we're going to be reading from book two, which is Wizard of the North. And I'm just going to set it up for you. So uh, the cast of characters, David is playing Alhina. He's a senior messenger, messenger to the Chamber of the Wise. He's an aged man of the world with long white hair, long white beard, white pupilless eyes. He carries a tall staff. Now, Dave's got a staff set aside so he doesn't break his computer. Dave is also <laughs> going to fill in and play Pollard. So uh, 
Uh, Pollard does not look like that, but that's okay. We'll forgive you, Dave, because you weren't supposed to originally play Pollard. Uh, our guest was. So Pollard is a third in command of the Songbirthian Guard. He's a dignified half giant with short red hair, and he wields a double bladed broadsword. If you ever met this man, he's a beast. He's mm. a half giant, and his sword is bigger than, taller than I am. And there's two blades that come out of the hill. This is something else. Christy is going to be playing uh, a real short character here, Long Sight. He's a sailor in the crow's nest aboard the gerrymander. I think he gets one or two lines. She's also going to be playing another sailor on the rail. He's a random sailor in the scene. He's horrified by what they're seeing as a ship pulls into the harbor. She's also going to be playing one of my favorite characters of all my books, oh, yeah. Sakura. Uh, Sakura's an archer with the song's birthing guard. She's, she's, she has auburn hair, freckles, slate gray, archer's cap. She's mischievous, and she's very cheeky. And Christy's also going to play Captain Just Thor. like Christy. <laughs> so this is where you should have a little goatee, Chrissy. Captain Thor, uh, captain of the ocean going vessel, gerrymander, well kept, short black hair, well mannered. And then I'm going to be playing Rook. He's a former leader of the group of five. <laughs> if anyone see my Soul Forge cover, he's Perfect. on. <laughs> I'm also going to be playing Omar, and that is the one that uh, Russell uh, Russell Trimble was supposed to play. He does libraries and he loves reading Omar, and he does that uh, character very well. So. If I ever cast Omar, I'll cast him as the voice anyway. So he's Omar is the helmsman aboard the ocean going vessel gerrymander. He's a simple half giant with red hair and beard. He's got slumped shoulders. He wields a massive war, man, war hammer. And he's got to be one of my favorite characters too of all my books. He's a very simple man. He's huge. He's just a kind of dummy's not a nice term. It's not a nice way to describe him, but. You know, as an author, I should have a better way to describe him. But right now, I'm at a loss. But he's just very simple, and, and but he's probably the wisest man in the series. He's just down to earth. He's just so commonsensical, and uh, that's brought out in the narration. And I'm also going to be the narrator. So I'm doing a little bit more, and I thought I was going to because we lost our guest. So, so the scene set up. This extra is taken from the beginning chapters of Wizard of the North. And uh, I'll start at the ill-fated quest to the Underrealm as attempted. So this is a kind of a synopsis of uh, book one. It's attempting a return to port it had weighed anchor in many months before aboard the ocean going brig gerrymander still not certain they're following the right heading as they were transported via mysterious portal when slurian destroyed iconoclast spire at the end of book one soul forge the crew and the quest members alike are apprehensive about what they're returning to so you guys let me know when you're ready and we'll take her off i'm ready all set all right alina cyrus stepped on the gerrymander's foredeck using a walking staff to balance himself against the roll of the ship. He found Pollard Brainbridge exactly where he had left him yesterday, leaning against the ship's forward rail, the dejected songs worthy and oblivious to the spray washing over the deck as the bow cut through heavy seas. Sidling up to Pollard, Alina rests his elbows on the wet rail, respecting Pollard's silence. The half-giant blamed himself for slurring Mataka's death. He had stood on the banks of the Mystic River and almost single-handedly kept the demon army at bay with his massive two-bladed sword, providing Slurian the time he required to immerse himself in a suicidal battle with forces far beyond the realm of normal men. In the end, Slurian had succumbed to the river's pull and was lost. In the uneasy silence, Elhina leaned over the rail, but whatever the song's birthing was staring at was a mystery. Pollard suddenly stood up straight. Do you see that? Elena jumped to the start. Smoke stretching as far as the eye can see. Pollard continued. He stepped away from the rail and bounded toward the quarter deck. Come on, old man. Let's see what the captain thinks. Elena struggled to keep up to Pollard's long strides, his stiff or his staff clumping the cadence of his quickened gait. He looked over his shoulder once more, but it still only saw the horizon. By the time he reached the helm's deck, set high above the rest of the ship's surfaces, Pollard had already engaged Captain Thor and the bandy-legged helmsman Omar in conversation. Omar was the only man Alhina knew to surpass Pollard in height. Thor's tone did not bode well. If we were transported back to the side of the portal, our course suggests the smoke can only be coming from one place, Zephyr. Pollard's brows knit together. Then we straight off course. There can't be any active volcanoes near Madrigal Bay. Thor threw his hands up, but it was Olmar who spoke. Nay, if we've been said right, I knows me course. That's the spine of Madrigal, or I'm a creative horse. Plan 
and ho! Came a cry from the crow's nest. Thor called up to the sailor, long sight. Can you make out where? A long while elapsed before Longside replied, Aye, tis the bay that's smoking. I didn't like it, Captain, Omar said, knuckles white upon the wheel. Thor blew out a long breath and nodded, jumping into action. Man the oars, ready the ballista. Running to the top of the port side staircase, he <laughs> commanded, Arm yourselves, Madrigal Bay is under attack. As Jared Mander plowed through the waves, it became apparent to Alina that the entire horizon was shrouded in black smoke. Been tacked more light, he muttered to Pollard. Oh, sorry. That's your line there, Alina. Thank, thank you. Been attacked more like, he muttered to Pollard. And raised to the ground. And then there's there's a break in the in the action, and so the ocean golden vessel gerrymander it slips into the harbor of Madrigal Bay, and so there's a bit of a time break here, and we continue. One of the sailors on the rail commented on the state of the great city rising up on the shores around them. Maybe they got away. I don't see no boats. The boats are there. Pollard's voice killed any optimism the sailor attempted to evoke. Look beneath the waves. The sailor frowned until realization set in. He swallowed hard. A gerrymander slid into the harbor. Pollard's revelation proved true. Ghostly hulks of large ships could be seen beneath the water's surface. Spars and yard arms protruded from the gently rolling water, some displaying the tattered remnants of burnt sailcloth. A female sailor's shrill scream sounded on Pollard's right. Everybody could. <coughs> the man in charge of the ballista almost pulled the release lever and put a hole in the foredeck. The sound of retching followed the scream as a bloated white corpse entangled in the loose rigging of a submerged yard arm bobbed to the surface of the water. The only sound in the harbor, other than the rhythmic slapping of the waves on the shoreline, were the cries of carrion birds circling overhead. Pollard searched the mountains surrounding the burnt out city. Come sundown, anyone still alive within the city would have far bigger problems to worry about. So then uh, just a narrator's voice here. They put in the dock and discover a few survivors living amongst the destroyed ruins of the once great city. Realizing the need to learn the fate of the rest of the kingdom, several members of the ill-fated quest to Soul Forge decide to embark on an inland journey and begin to say their farewells. Stepping back, Elena waited for Thor to say goodbye to Olmar. Take care of them, Olmar, like you do, Gerrymander. You'll be sorely missed, my plinth of a friend. Your road is sure to be fraught with peril. Ack! Omar said, slapping the captain on the back, nearly knocking him off his feet. They'll never get by, Omar, Captain. Thor caught himself and looked up at his giant helmsman. Woe we'll betide anyone foolish enough to try. Omar slapped him again. Oh, he not my good friend. Thor turned to clasp his hand. We've known each other for less than two months. Yet it feels like a lifetime. Alina leaned on his staff. Aye, close relationships are forged fast in desperate times. It's been an honor sailing with you, kind sir. If it pleases you, give my regards to Vice Chamber Master Solomon. He and I were once great mates, if you can believe that. Alina inclined his head. Is that so? And what happened to change that? Lugubrious happened. I was sent to help rebuild Zephyr's fleet, while good old Solomon, being as smart as he is, took up with the chamber. Hmm. Interesting indeed. Alina replied. Omar swaggered over and slapped Alina on the back. It was all that Alina could do not to yell. The bay's in good hands with Captain Thor around. The city's safer in Alliance Cup, I'm not sure. Alina staggered forward a step. He ran his tongue along his teeth. To ensure none were loose. Easy, Omar. Thor cautioned his eccentric first mate. You forget your strength. The captain pulled Alina in for an embrace and whispered, Be careful, my friend. I hear things aren't as they seem in the chamber these days. Alina broke the embrace, but kept his voice low. I, who told you? Thor hesitated before answering. The innovator, if you can believe that. Averick? Really? Aye. 
He also told me about your recent fallout with the chamber. I believe he was concerned about how the chamber master would receive you should we make it back. Alina raised his eyebrows, wondering whether Avrik had told the captain how they had deceived Baron Lichman into ordering the gerrymander to assist the quest. There was more to that man than he let on. Omar folded his arms and nodded his agreement. The art of a tiger, that one. I, a real terror in his day, that something happened to him during his time with Silurian. In the end, he turned out okay. At the mention of Silurian, everyone fell quiet until Pollard traced up with Sadira and Yarstaff in tow. Hair pulled back tight and tucked beneath her slate gray suede archer's cap. Sadira curtsied. I'm ready, Master Saris. Alina smiled at the pretty young girl with many freckles. You can just call me Alina. Any luck with the horses? Her smile faded. No, Master Saris. There are none to spare. Alina. He corrected her. Alas, it is as we thought. Sidira offered him a sly smile. Aye, Master Cirrus. Flustered, Alina said to the captain. Well, I guess this is it. May God be with you, Captain. Aye, if he can spare the time. I'm thinking he has more pressing matters to attend at the moment. Thor embraced Alina again. Keep your eyes open, my friend. These are strange times. Be sure to look after the lug. The captain's eyes indicated his bandy-legged helmsman. Alina <laughs> spit out a laugh. <laughs> I do not believe I need to worry about Omar. I will be hard-pressed protecting them from him. Rook's voice startled him as he watched the captain make his way back to an awaiting skiff. Sidira tells me they can't spare horses, even for one as aged as you. Alina scowled at Rook, but saw the mischief in his eyes. Have you decided your route? I, knowing how Silurian and Avarik's trip over Twitch's Gorge went, I dare say we shall take the inland route. Cut down the mews and over. Excellent. Then we travel together for a while, Rook said. At least until the fork. Perhaps we'll find mounts there. Are there any boats to be had? Sunak, sunk, every last one. Pollard interjected. <laughs> we wouldn't be able to get them past the Rivergate Bridge in any event. Rook eyed the broken span clogging the mouth of the river. Good point. He turned his gaze skyward. Well then, good messenger, it's an excellent day for a walk. Then there's a bit of a break in here. There's a chapter break. And Rook, Elena, Yarstaff, Pollard, Sidir, and Almer set off across the mountainous countryside. Following the trail along the southern bank of the mighty Madrigal River, the small company made their way east into the mountains. Several times over the next few days, the path lifted into the heights, circumventing unpassable frothy chasms. They ascended one of these stretches now into the afternoon sun. Pollard in the lead, he smiled over his shoulder at his companions. We should see the valley over the next few hours. Sure enough, rounding a bend, the trail peaked. They stopped to take in the view. Pollard's shoulders slumped and his mouth dropped open. He had made his, this trek several times, and on each occasion, he relished the moment the lush lands of Zephyr appeared below, brilliant golden hues of farmland stretching on forever. The rich blue of the Madrigal cutting a jagged line through vibrant green pastures, the fields dotted by solitary tours rising majestically above the rich tapestry. Despite his faint hope that the area had escaped the sorcerer's wrath, the land ahead spread dull and black, clear to the horizon. Even the Madrigal appeared gray and lifeless below them, a reflection of the devastation. May God have mercy on their souls, Alina whispered. Withdrawing his massive two-bladed weapon, Pollard rushed down the hill. The fork was the largest town between Madrigal Bay and Millsford. If it had suffered the same damage as Madrigal Bay, he feared over 3,000 people may have lost their lives. Pollard, it's too late, Sidira called after him. You never know. His booming voice came back. The others looked at Sidira. She shook her head. The fork is two days from here. He probably means to run the entire way. What an oaf. Together they tromped after him. Then there's a chapter break. 
So the companions gather in the center of the burnt out village known as the fork after searching for it for survivors. A day and a half later, Pollard stood in the fort town center, sword loosely in hand, staring at the stone well, the only structure left unscathed. Other than the stench of rotting corpses, there was no trace of the town's inhabitants. Alina Yarstaff and Rook stood with him, watching Sidira and Omar approach from the eastern part of the city. The female archer, clothing dark with sweat and hair disheveled and sprinkled with ash, walked up to the well with a resigned look on her face. No one alive that way. I gather the same holds true in every quarter. Pollard stared at the ground, chewing on his lips in a futile attempt to keep his emotions in check. A tear rolled down his cheek. Rook muttered, not a soul. Sidira stepped beside Pollard, throwing an arm around his lower back. Come on, big guy. That's not all bad. There's signs of a mass migration along West Castle Road. If I had to guess, I'd say the survivors made their way toward the king. Pollard sniffed. What about the bodies? You can't just leave them like this. Sidira gave the others a sad smile. There's nothing here for us but death and disease. It'll take too much time to gather all the bodies and burn them. If you want to help, you must get Rook to King Malcolm. She looked at Omar. Midge and I will see Alhina to the chamber. We can't undo what's been done, but together we might have a say in what's to come. The big man's shoulders straightened. Just a bit. Come on, you big softy. Get your arse moving. Don't keep the king waiting. She winked and smiled up at him. And guess what? Pollard gave her a quizzical stare. She waved a hand in front of her face and turned up her nose. The bridge to West Castle Road is out, which is a good thing. It's high time you had a bath. Pollard sheathed his sword, his eyes moist and red. He tried to smile, but it wouldn't come. On top of everything else they had witnessed today, Sidira knew Pollard hated goodbyes. You still traveling west of the Muse? Rook asked Alina. Alina nodded. Sidira wishes to follow Millsford Road. We will stop by Splendor Falls to inform Master Paul. From there, it's an easy jaunt down the old Gutian Road around the bottom of the Muse. Be sure to stay clear of Torpid Marsh, Rick cautioned. I am certain Sidira will ensure our course is true. I have little desire to encounter anything in that forsaken place. Sidira punched and hugged Pollard. Take care of this big lummox. Rook smiled. No worries there. I'll be hard pressed to get my own blows in before he deals whatever with whatever is foolish enough to come against us. Alina stepped up to the big man, offering his hand, afraid of what was to come as a result. Pollard gave him a half-hearted smile, grabbed his hand, and pulled him in for an excruciating embrace. Alina feared his ribs would crack, but there was nothing to do until the giant released him. Thankfully, Sidira intervened. Easy, you big oaf. You're going to suffocate Alhina. Alhina turned to clutch Rook's hand. You take great care, my friend. You have been through a lot in the last while. We all have, but you especially. We need you strong. He looked around at the devastation. I fear this is only the beginning. Thank you, Alhina, for everything. If not for you, Slurian might never have been found. I don't believe I did him any favors. Alina whispered. Nonsense. You gave him back his life, even if it was only for a short while. You gave him a chance to be whole again. I'm sure he appreciated what you did for him. I know I do. Sidir interrupted and gave Rook a hug and peck on the cheek. Take good care of yourself, Bowman. I hope our paths cross again. You too, Sidira. I rest assured knowing my friend, he nodded to Helena, is in excellent hands. Good luck keeping up with him. Sidira laughed and turned to the <laughs> staff. The muscular boy was almost as tall as her shoulders. His big eyes looked shyly at the ground, but Omar's hand propelled him forward with such force that Sidira had to catch the odd creature to keep him from knocking her over. Go on, ye ugly beastie. Tis only a wee lassie. You needn't be afeard. Yarstaff untangled himself and looked away. Sidira glanced at Omar. Is he always this quiet? Omar guffawed. Ha! Hardly, missy. Shy about the lasses, I've been thinking. Ye beastie. Yarstaff proffered an orange furred hand to Sidira. 
Sit here and kiss your staff's furry forehead. If that big lummox gives you any guff, bite his knee. Yarstaff lifted his eyes long enough to peer at her, the tiniest of smiles lighting up his face. Beside them, Omar accepted Pollard's, Pollard's meaty handshake and pulled him into a quick embrace and then held the song's breathing guard at arm's length. Despite Averick's kidding, ye are even bigger than me. You listen to what I was telling ya. Pollard forced a semblance of a smile past the trembling bottom lip. Elhina went to grab his rucksack from beside the well, but Pollard snatched him off his feet, tears running freely down his cheeks. I'm sorry, Elhina. I tried to save him. I tried so hard. His words became unintelligible. Elhina shushed him. There was nothing anyone could have done. Only Silurian was strong enough to enter the river. You allowed him to do that. What had to be done? If he had not kept the demons off his back, we would all be dead. He chose his fate. He would not have had it any other way. Your bravery gave him the time he needed to fulfill an insatiable desire that had eaten at him for 20 years. There is no blame for what happened. Events went way beyond our control. Sidira came to Lahina's rescue again, prying the big man away from him and holding Pollard until he got himself under control. And then there's a wee chapter break here. As the two groups parted ways, Sidira, Omar, and Helena followed the Madrigal River southeast along Milford Road, while Rook, Pollard, and Yarstab disappeared into the ruined city along a debris-strewn road that would lead them to where the West Castle Road branched away. The group's parting was one of the saddest events Elena had ever witnessed. An utterly dejected Pollard dragged his feet along the ash-covered ground, shoulders slumped and head hung low. It had taken the senseless death in the fork to finally crack Pollard's shell. Elhina sighed. Moving forward, it was for the best, but he hated leaving his friend in such a state. Sidira placed one arm around Elhina's shoulder and the other halfway around Omar's waist, propelling them forward. Come on, old man. I think this is the point where you start imparting to us your ancient wisdoms. You know, how things were different back in your day. How our generation doesn't appreciate the value of hard work and respect and all that crap. Alina shot her a look. Omar's shorty laugh disturbed the unnatural stillness in the fork. Ha <laughs> ha Aye, pups, tell us a story. Together, the bizarre trio started along the Millsford Road. A young female archer clad in gray. A giant bandy legged sailor whose girth was twice that of the other two combined and an old man who looked like a wizard. That was great. But, that was a lot of fun. So Dave, you need to wear that costume at the next event. Yeah, yeah. That is absolutely amazing, <laughs> especially if you know someone that you know is coming towards your booth. Oh, my God. Just slip it on, and they'll come to your booth kind of looking for you, and you just kind of sit back in the back like this. That'd be hilarious. <laughs> That would be way too funny. No and actually, you give me an idea. I, I'm at the Wadu Medieval Fair next week. Maybe I'll do that. I will uh, wear this, and that, hopefully they won't even know who I am. <laughs> Are you, you be looking for that, uh, that wannabe writer? <laughs> that could be pretty funny. You should record it. <laughs> yeah, it will. Yeah, yeah, it will be. I, actually, I'm going to do that. That'll be good. And Christy, I really loved how you kept flipping back and forth. I didn't realize you actually had that costume until I looked up, and then I, oh, yeah, I'm saying, <laughs> on my screen, you're very small. I got you in the, like, yeah, so I can see the text there. There's only one I way. Hope, I hope you didn't ruin your voice, Christy. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say, would you, oh, ruin my voice? Oh, my God, I know. <laughs> I can feel it. <laughs> I'm set up now. I mean, it's like I could play George Custer. God. God, God yes. Moses. Moses, yes. Alhina, Alhina, yeah, Gandalf, yeah. I was thinking of Gandalf. <laughs> Dumbledore. Uh, Dumbledore. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, go to your Hollywood auditions with that outfit, yeah. and I'm sure they'll have roles <laughs> for you. Anyway, I'm gonna get out. This is very hot. I can imagine. <laughs> so is this? <laughs> did you have to, Richard? Did you seriously? Did you have to cut like a place for your mouth? I, I I did trim it so you know it's, it's straight across. It there was a slot there, but it was so long it was getting in my mouth. I was spitting out yeah. last time I wore it. Yeah, it was a, it's not too bad now, but oh. it's, just, it's just a cheap little beer I bought. So yeah, 
Yeah, it's not, not a lot of quality. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, Dave's back. Oh, who's that? Who is know. that? Well, it's about time you showed up. Jeez, we've been going an hour and five minutes, and finally Dave decided to show up. <laughs> I know. I know. I I just couldn't be bothered. You missed that Santa was here and he was giving out gifts. <laughs> I got a brand new Corvette. <laughs> Good for you. With a with an engine starter and everything that I didn't have to replace myself. <laughs> anyway, uh, so that's it. We've really gone over our time today, but uh, that's fine. Uh, thank you, Christy and Dave, for making that read very enjoyable. Uh, I, I always love the story with Elhina and uh, Omar, so and Sadira as well. So even though I always people always ask me what's my best book, I always say it's the one on my computer. But what's my favorite book? It'll always be the Sulford Saga because that's the one that sat with me for 35 years. So even though I don't think there is written as well, and there were a couple of mistakes you saw in the narrative there that uh, I didn't read, obviously the mistakes, but that's because I was trying to shorten it for us. I took bits ah. and pieces out. So if you see those sure. mistakes in there, those aren't, those aren't actually in the book. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I've done that. editing mine's going, oh, he's got a mistake. <laughs> and I was thinking the same thing. And oh, yeah, no, I, I kind of condensed a wee bit just to get the whole thing in there because sure. I wanted to get that scene to right to the point where, uh, where Sadir and uh, Omar are mocking Elhina at the very end as they go for a walk. But Yeah, this is uh, sad they're parting of ways, but I'm sure they'll meet up again, or I hope. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. No, no, no. <laughs> no spoilers. So next October 12th, we're going to uh, have Canadian debutante author, actually not debutante anymore. She's actually, I think her next book will be coming out between now, and, or her second book will be coming out between now and airtime. So we're going to welcome Paige Taylor. And uh, she is someone who reached out to me a few years ago to do a talk with the uh, Muskoka Writers Group. And since then, I've formed a friendship with a few of the Muskoka writers. And it, people don't probably don't know where Muskoka is, obviously. Uh, Dave is five hours north of me, six hours depending on Toronto traffic. But uh, Muskoka is probably halfway, maybe a little mm -hmm. bit more closer to Dave than me with Toronto in the way. I'm not sure, but it's about halfway. So uh, it's up by Bracebridge. She lives in Bracebridge, Dave, so you'll know where that is. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I've You're, got hair? You're not used my, to having hair, yeah. I know. No, it's like um, I've got, what the heck? Still got hair stuck to me all over. It's yeah. like I'm pulling clumps of white hair. Your wife's going to take one look at you when you go to bed tonight. She's going, who you have been with? <laughs> Some blondie. <laughs> no, bingo. That's anyway, so we're, we're going to be reading an excerpt from Paige Taylor's uh, book, and we're also going to be reading an excerpt from Christy Stratos. And uh, Christy hasn't told me what she's reading yet, but uh, we will find out when we get there. So it's uh, we like the mystery. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go through a couple more chats here. Great reading chat as always. Thank you, Hillary. And I, those emojis are very small. I hope she's not flipping as the bird. Oh, thumbs up. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was confused. I mean, I was like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is the difference? I can't tell. She's a little cheeky, yeah. <laughs> and Louise, and yeah, and Louise Spilsbury, and she is a, a great science fiction author. She, she's got some awesome stuff out there. So look her up too if you're into uh, futuristic science fiction. She's a very near future, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So Louise always supports uh, Dave and I. And uh, she, I think she came out and saw you at the Mills Writers Festival, did she not? Yes, yes, we uh, we were talking at the uh, at the festival and uh, whatever it is. Uh, she had a, she had a little doggies with her. Yeah, yeah, and, I see. Uh, yeah, they. I think they rescued dogs from the. Garbage. Yeah, they, 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 they her rescued. husband's a, a, a notorious scuba diver. He's always scuba diving around the world, so especially in the Caribbean. So they bring dogs back and they look after them. They rescue dogs. Oh, so nice. It's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, uh, so I guess we'll wrap it up. If you guys have anything else that you want to say before we go. Now I'm just looking forward to the next time. A month, a month. I have to wait a month. Yeah. <laughs> Hot cakes from. Ball. There we go. Yeah, that's the type of dog, that's apparently. The yeah, it's, it, 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 just because it's legal in Canada now, that's not what she's talking about. They're actually a type of dog. Yeah, <laughs> that's not an edible. That's right. Okay, so thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, people that stuck around, that's that's great. Uh, we had you for over an hour, which is a lot longer than we generally do. So thank you for your patience. And I hope you enjoyed the story. And uh, the telling from Dave and Christy was awesome. So thank you guys for making my story shine. I appreciate it. Oh, loved reading it. Loved it. Yeah, it was fun. So until we meet again, everybody, take good care. Good night.